church, let's stand. Lift up the name of the Lord. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father means. Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. church we have the awesome opportunity to witness two coming forward for baptism this morning uh, they come knowing that there's nothing special about this water that saves but this is their first act of obedience in worshiping Jesus as their Savior all right this is six-year-old Mitchell Larson so Mitchell shared with me that while watching a curriculum for his homeschool curriculum, watching a video that the teacher on there shared uh, the plan of salvation and shared the gospel and what it means to be saved. And, and in that moment, he understood and he believed in Jesus. 
And uh, he's, he's talked with Miss Tammy and her team, and he stands before you this morning professing Jesus as his Savior. So Mitchell, it is my joy, but my responsibility to ask you, who is Lord of your life? Jesus. Amen. Mitchell, based on your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior, I can baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Miss Susie Bracy, and Susie shared with me that it was a, a few months ago, right here on a Sunday service. She had been attending church for some time, but on that Sunday, the gospel was presented, the invitation was made, and she came forward. She said, God moved that day, and he is continuing to move in her life. So Susie, it is my joy, but my responsibility to ask you, who is Lord of your life? Jesus Christ. Amen. Susie, based on your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior, I can baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, thank you, Robbie. First service, we had the opportunity to baptize a husband and wife together. And so uh, it's just been a good, good day. And uh, we say this all the time around here, but the reason why we say it is because uh, I, think, I think it would be so easy for us just to uh, take for granted and lose the, uh, the importance of what this represents. Uh, we know that baptismal waters does not forgive or save or do anything along those lines. It is only faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But when someone stands before these water, or stands before us in these waters, and the question is asked, who is the Lord of your life? What they are doing is publicly professing and being publicly obedient through baptism. Jesus Christ is my Lord. And he's washed away all sins. And so what a beautiful representation. But what I say all the time is that we see it happen so much around here. May we never take for granted or may it never lose what it symbolizes in importance that, um, that may we never get to the point where we're not moved over the fact that someone has been forgiven and set free and knows Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know, this past year, we, we've had the opportunity as a church to see something um, just miraculous as far as the number of people that have responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in the 80-year history of our church, we've seen more people publicly profess Christ as Lord and Savior uh, in one year than ever before in the history of our church. And here's what I believe that is a, what it represents. It represents that there's still power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that God, God still honors the sharing of his word. And so you guys have been faithful to go out and share. Jesus saved me and Jesus will save you as well. Hey, let me go ahead and welcome you all. Thank you for coming and being here in this service. My goodness, it is a mess out there. So uh, as I told the first service, whoever's been praying for rain, we've had enough. You can stop. <laughs> Uh, we, we don't want any more. And uh, just as yesterday was such a beautiful day, today is a, uh, well, it's a soppy day. Um, but we appreciate you coming. First service was down a little bit. This service is a little bit down. But you know what, man? You are the people who really love Jesus. It's the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It is cold. It is wet. And you've dared to brave the weather, weather to come out and join us today. Maybe you're visiting with us today. And if you're a visitor here on this Sunday, you are the top flight visitor uh, we'd love to get a chance to meet you. I met some folks after the first service that were here for the very first time. Uh, we'd love to have a record of your visit. We'd love to be able to answer any questions that you might have about our church. And maybe you're here and you're looking for a church home, a church family, a way that you can grow in your knowledge when it comes to the Lord. And uh, maybe this is the place. Do us a favor. Fill out one of our guest registration cards. Now, there are physical cards that are all around this building. We put them in the chair back pockets. And even though there may not be a card in the 
pocket directly in front of you. If you look down the row, you'll find one. And uh, if you don't want to do that, then you can fill it out electronically. You don't even have to worry about the card. At the end of the service, you'll actually see a slide that comes up. And on there, you'll see a lot of different words that may, uh, may correspond to a decision that you're making. And one of those is the word guest. And all you have to do is text the word guest to the phone number, and they'll reach out to you to get your information. Uh, and our staff will follow up with you over the next several days. But let us encourage you to do that today. Let us also encourage this. Whether you're filling out the card, uh, a physical card you're doing electronically. If you've never come by the Welcome Center, please do that today. You can't miss it. It's right out there in the main lobby area. Come out there and we'll give you information. And we also have, I mean, it's not much, but it is, it's a sweet little treat that we would like to give you as our guests today. And if you brought somebody with you, it's your responsibility to make sure they come by the Welcome Center before they leave, Okay. I'm going to go ahead and ask our ushers to come forward this morning. We continue to worship by giving our tithe and our offering. And, you know, what a faithful giving church you are. Because of your obedience to the Lord in this matter, God provides resources for our church that we are able to make much of Jesus Christ locally and all the way across the globe. And I don't really believe that we'll know this side of heaven, just how God has used this church over the 80 years that she's existed to share and to sow the seeds of the gospel. And so it's because of your faithful giving we have the resources to do that. You can naturally put something in the bucket as it comes by, or you can give electronically. You'll see the slide on the screen where you take out your phone. It's called Text to Give. It's safe, it's convenient, and uh, all you have to do is text HPBC to the number on the screen, and uh, it'll kind of lead you through that process. But let us be faithful to give. Let us be faithful to to give. We give today not because we put our faith and trust in this church. We give today not because we're like, hey, that was a great sermon. I mean, the reality is you don't know if it's a good sermon or not. You hadn't heard it yet. Um, we don't give today because we're like, I, I was really digging on all those songs that were sung. No, we give today um, because we have richly been blessed and we want to be obedient to the Lord. And the Lord will take our gift and he will use it to do something eternal and miraculous. And so we give today, um, not putting our hope and our trust in the gift, we give today putting our hope and trust in the giver of the gift. Okay? I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Our ushers are going to come across and we'll continue to worship as we give and also as we sing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can gather together in this place today. Thank you for what we've already seen this morning, the four individuals in both services professing you as Lord and Savior. Thank you that you allow us as a church to be able to see pretty regularly the fruit of the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, that all across this room we see evidence of changed lives. Thank you, Lord, that today you invite us to come to you just as we are, that there are folks in this room that desperately need salvation. And Father, there's a great majority of people in this room. We have already been recipients. Our lives have been changed. Oh Lord, we, we confess before you that we're not all that we want to be. And thank you, Jesus. We're not all through you that we're going to be. But we praise you that we're not what we used to be. And so we exalt your name. The thing that we can gather together in this place today as a body of Christ, as your bride, and be able to exalt your name and be able to fellowship. What a great gift that is. Thank you for even the roof that you've given us over our head. We know that there are other brothers and sisters churches today around this world. They're, they're gathered together under a tree. They're meeting out in the field. Father, there are some that we know are, they're meeting in secrecy for fear that they will be imprisoned or lose their lives. So, Father, we praise you and thank you for the resources that you've given us. Thank you for even this building. But we know you want to do more than just build a building. Lord, you want to build a church and you want to build your people. So today, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask you to roam across this place and accomplish what only you can do. For it is in the name of Jesus we pray today. Amen. I was lost, I was blind 
death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now, I begin with you. Least from my chain. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. God, we are so thankful this morning for the freedom that you have given us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. God, we are so grateful. We are not worthy. God, yet you continue to pour out your grace and mercy on us. And we are so thankful. God, we pray that your spirit falls in this place today and that lives are changed so that only you could get the glory, God. We love you and we praise you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I was going to get him to keep singing. He wouldn't look at me, though. It's all right. That's all right. Have you have your Bibles this morning, please open up to John chapter 8. We're going to be, uh, our text is going to be verses 30 through 42 of John chapter 8. Uh, I, saw, I saw 
uh, I, don't, I don't know where they ended up. Two young men grew up here in our church. Where'd Terry Lee and Bud go? They were in the first service? Well, there you go. You should have told me in the first service, Patrick, right? Yeah. Anyway, two, two young men. One is pastor. He's a church planner in Cincinnati, and the other one uh, is on staff at a church in the, uh, is, it, is it Belton, Texas, or kind of in the, in the uh, rolling hill area of Texas, and they, uh, they both met their wives here at our church and grew up here at our church and went off to seminary, and then God, God called them uh, to, uh, to, to ministry, and they're serving in those areas. And so I, uh, I regret that I didn't, didn't say that in the first service. But anyway, we're, uh, we're thankful to have folks that are visiting with us today. So today we're going to talk about truth, truth. Maybe you've said this or maybe you've heard somebody else say this. The truth will set you free. And while most folks have heard that said before, not everybody knows that Jesus is the one who said that. That the truth shall set you free. Now, when it comes to truth, I'm always reminded of a story. There were four high school boys and they were late for class one day. And so when they showed up to class, the teacher said, well, how come you were late? And they said, we had a flat tire. The teacher, she was a little skeptical whether that's true or not. So here's what she did. She took each one of those high school boys. She sent them to one of the four corners in the classroom, gave them a blank piece of paper and said, now write on this piece of paper, which tire was flat. They were busted. The truth shall set you free. Well, we're going to see this morning again, Jesus talks a lot about truth. And before we dig into our text, I want to kind of give a little introduction about what he is saying here. And I want to issue a warning. Here is the warning. Truth decay is destroying our moral foundation. We have dentists that take care of tooth decay, but I'm alarmed about the rise of truth decay in America. Now, I grew up at a time in America, I mean, I'm a few weeks away from being 53 years old. Take your phone out right now. My birthday's December the 24th. Put it down. And you know, if you've been here for any amount of time, what is it that I would love as a gift for my birthday? Thank you, cold hard cash. Still paying for a wedding just a few weeks ago. (laughs) But I grew up in a time in the 70s and 80s that there was such a thing in America as absolute truth. I remember growing up at a time where the Ten Commandments were posted on the wall of every classroom in our school. I grew up in a time where no one was doing any mass shootings. Could it be just maybe because we taught them thou shalt not kill? I mean, honestly... There were guys that would come to school with guns in their truck. Some of you grew up the way I did. They had a rifle rack right along the back window of their pickup truck, and they had their hunting rifle in the back of their pickup truck, and nobody was shooting anybody else. Today, truth has become subjective. Today, truth has become personal. Today, people say this, there is no such thing as absolute truth. Whatever I feel to be true, that is my truth. And my truth may not be your truth, but it is still true. But now think about the the contradiction there. Not too long ago, I had somebody tell me, you know what? There is no such thing as absolute truth. And I said, can you be absolutely sure there is no such thing as absolute truth? Do you see the contradiction? Being able to say there is no such thing as absolute truth is an absolute within itself. And yet, that's the time we find ourselves living in. Not long ago, the George Barner research firm asked Americans about what they believed about absolute truth. The statistics are alarming. 66% of adults say that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Even scarier, 91% of teenagers that were surveyed said there is no such thing as absolute truth. Now, to illustrate this, let's just consider the hot-button topic of the day, gender identity. 
And I know that there are people who struggle with gender confusion. You say, how are we to respond? We're to respond uh, the way that we respond to anyone that is being deceived and anyone that is believing a lie and struggling with it. How do we respond? We respond with love and compassion and truth and hope. However, we've arrived at a time where the culture says this. Whatever gender you feel that you are today, that's your truth. And it's okay. Today, if you sign up for a new account on Facebook, and this changes from time to time, and I'm lowballing this, okay? But if you sign up for an account on Facebook, you will receive over 20 different gender options to choose from. Now, what I'm going to say is, is going to, it would make some people mad, but because the truth, it will set you free, or as I heard one pastor add the tagline, it'll set you free or it'll make you mad, that while we live in a culture that says there are anywhere from 50 to 70 different gender options, Jesus said God created them, he created them male, and he created them female. And that is just one example of many different examples where we've replaced biblical truth with what is known as personal subjective truth. You know, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah about this. It's almost like Isaiah is reading our news, man. Listen to what God said through the prophet Isaiah about the danger. In Isaiah 520, look at the screens. Here's what he said. He said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. To say that all truth is subjective, the results of that position have become dangerous. If there is no such thing as absolute truth, well then the Holocaust was just Hitler's truth. If there's no such thing as absolute truth, then what happened on 9-11 is not evil, that that was just Osama bin Laden's truth. If there's no such thing as absolute truth, then what we saw being or taking place in Israel just a few weeks ago with Hamas, we cannot call that evil, we cannot call that wrong, we cannot call that murderous, that if there's no absolute truth, then it's merely the truth according to Hamas. And we say, we would never make that. But hear me, as a culture, when we adopt the position that there is no absolute truth, then not only are we headed towards chaos, we're already drowning in chaos. In the Old Testament book, Judges. It's almost like it was a prophecy that was being written. And it tells us during that time that the times were evil. Listen to what it says. Because each man did what was right in his own eyes. That is a definition of truth in our culture. That truth is whatever you think it is. And yet that's, it. that's not what Jesus said. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus is going to talk this morning about truth. We've been going through the book of John now for 37, 38 weeks. And we're going to look at this text, John chapter 8, picking up in verse 30, going all the way to verse 42. Look at it with me as Jesus talks about truth. In verse 30, as he spoke these words, many believed in him, him being Jesus. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And then he says in verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father and you do what you have seen with your father. And then they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And then Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. 
But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. What they're alluding to is this. Hey, Jesus, our mom was not pregnant before she married our dad. So, so they're making a personal insult of Jesus. We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and I came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Now, here's what we're going to see today. We have this ongoing debate that has been taking place between Jesus and what I call the Jewish religious mafia, right? The Jewish religious leaders. And this debate was eventually going to lead to their arrest and crucifixion of Jesus. But there's something that we've seen many times as we've been walking through the book of John. The statement, for it was not yet his time. For it was not yet his time. You see, they were not going to arrest him and crucify him until it was his time. And his time would be at the time of Passover. Why? Because Jesus Christ would be the ultimate lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world forever. So with that being said, in this passage of Scripture in John chapter 8, we see Jesus talking about truth, specifically three important truths. One truth has to do with, uh, it has to do with our sin. Another truth has to do with discipleship. And still a third truth has to do with freedom. Let's look at them in this order, discipleship, sin, and freedom. The first truth is this. Sincere disciples, they continue to grow spiritually. If you heard me, say amen. I just want to see if I get to say amen. Spiritual growth continues to take place with sincere disciples. Look what he says in verse 31. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Now, I think a lot of times we think that everybody there in Jerusalem was opposing Jesus. That's not true. Matter of fact, you can look back up in verse 30, and it says in verse 30 that there were many there in Jerusalem that came to believe in him. And so they heard him teach, they saw him do the miracles, and they made the decision that they were going to follow after Jesus Christ. But yet there were no doubt some in this population, some in this crowd, who we would say they were only mentally accepting Jesus that in just a few weeks, they would also be a part of the crowd that was crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus makes a statement. He says, it's good that you believe in me, but the proof that you're really my disciple is, you'll continue to follow me. You'll continue to obey me. Do you know that same truth is here today? Did you know that there are crowds of people that have some kind of initial experience of making a public profession of faith to follow Jesus Christ, and they may even be baptized, but they don't continue in their walk with him? I've heard them called spiritual dropouts before. Right now, Highland Park Baptist Church has over 4,000 names on our church roll. These names represent people who at one time or another indicated that they made, a, 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 they made a decision sincerely to believe in Jesus Christ. But then according to Jesus, the question is, are they sincere disciples? Are they real followers? Did they continue in his word? Well, you decide. You decide if they continue in their word. Almost half of our members never ever show up for public worship. They seldom, if ever, read their Bible and they seldom, if ever, pray. See, here's what we've got to understand. We've got to understand that having your name on a church roll is not the same thing as having your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Lamb's Book of Life is much more important than having your name on some list within some church. And I get today that I'm speaking to those of you that are here, right? You're not the ones. 
You're the super saints the Sunday after Thanksgiving. You don't feel good about yourself. You ate way too much. Had a hard time. Had to get three pairs of britches before you could find one that would fit before you came today. Pouring down rain outside. Freezing cold here in the panhandle. My lands. It was 50 this morning. (laughs) You had every reason in the world not to show up. You thought, well, I might as well go. Or some of you are like, you know what? I may miss a lot, but I ain't going to miss gathering together with the bride of Christ. So I know that I don't really need to be saying this to those of you because you are here. So do me a favor this week. When you actually see some of them that I am talking about, would you please tell them that I was speaking of them this past Sunday? But it's not just here that it talks about this. There are many passages of Scripture in the New Testament that actually confirm that real evidence of of discipleship is you are going to continue spiritually to grow. Again, sincere followers of Christ grow spiritually. Look at this one. This is in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. It'll be on the screens. It says, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. Being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing with gratitude. We are to grow in our faith. We're to spiritually mature. We're to grow older. You're like, well, I am growing older. I mean, we're not talking about physical growth. We're talking about spiritual growth. We do know that everyone grows older physically. I had someone not too long ago say this, that growing older is like a roll, a roll of toilet paper. And I thought, where are they going with this one? And here's what they said. And by the way, they were older. They said this, growing older is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. Well, Some of your, your, your life is a testimony to that. Growing older physically is what, not what he's talking about here. And it's not something that is automatically going to happen as you mature spiritually. There are folks that are like, well, give it to me quickly. Tell me how I can, I can grow older. I can mature spiritually. What is the secret of the success? What is the magic uh, formula, right? There's no magic pill that you take that is going to make you automatically mature spiritually in your faith. But there are four spiritual disciplines that if you press into these and you practice consistently over a period of time in your life, what will result is spiritual growth. Now, these are secondary to a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can try everything in the world, but if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, your faith and trust are in Him, you've been redeemed. No amount of practice, no amount of behavior is going to set you free. It's only through Him. But if you do know Him, there are four spiritual disciplines, and you guys know this. They're not easy, but they're simple. Here's the first one, talking to God in prayer. Did you know that if you want to grow and mature in your faith, you've got to spend some time in prayer? That you speak to the Lord daily. I'm going to spend time in prayer. Maybe you have a time that you spend, you set aside every morning. This is the time that I'm going to spend with him in prayer. There are many of you that are like, before my feet ever even hit the floor, I spend time with him in prayer. Some of you get up early and spend time in prayer. Some of you stay up late and you spend time in prayer. Others of you are like, you know what, my entire day, I'm praying without ceasing. I'm in a constant conversation with the Lord. I'm just saying that if you're ever going to mature and grow older, you're going to have to spend time talking to him. Sincere disciples continue to grow spiritually. But not only do you spend time with him in prayer, talking to him, but you spend time listening to God through his word. It means that there's a time where I open up the Bible and I actually read the Bible. I allow the Bible to read me. 
And I spend time in his word. There's a specific time or specific place that I spend in his word. But there's times that I spend in his word. It is a daily practice in my life, right? And so I'm going to listen to what God has to say. I'm amazed by the number of folks that sit there and they drive around. And I've told you this. You know, they're like, well, I was just driving around. I was looking at the billboards. And I was saying, God, if you got a word for me, make it say it on the billboard. And as I was driving around, I just saw the word and it said, nacho cheese. I don't know. What do you think? pastor, that God means by the word nacho cheese. I don't know what he means. But I can tell you where you can find really what he's saying. Go to his word. Go to his word. So how am I going to mature in my faith? How am I going to spiritually grow older? I'm going to spend time talking to him in prayer. I'm going to spend time listening to what he has to say through his word. I'm going to be a student of his word. And then third, the third discipline, I fellowship with the saints. I've had folks say this. Well, you ain't got to go to church to be a Christian. I agree with that statement. But if you're a Christian, you're going to want to go to church. Why? Because Christ loves his church. Christ loves his bride. We're the body of Christ. I'm amazed by those folks that sit there and say, oh, I love Jesus with all my heart. And I ain't been to church since 1985 because I've experienced church hurt. Now, I'm not trying to downplay church hurt. Church hurt is a very, very real thing. And that's the reason why you and I have to understand that I'm not being a part of a body or a bride that is perfect. I'm part of a body or a bride that is imperfect but has been forgiven. Why? because I do serve a groom, the Lord Jesus, that is 100% perfect. So I'll take my eyes off of men, but I'm going to fellowship with the body of Christ. I don't know about you, but I like coming to church. I like coming to church. I love walking down these hallways. There are things, this is how my mind works. I came in this morning, they've been doing all this Christmas decorating. And, And just in case those of you who thought that I'm the one who decorated that Tennessee tree and put it down there, I did not do that. I'm not that narcissistic, okay? But somebody out of love for their pastor, they got that tree, they decorated that tree, they sat it down there, and I'm telling you, we've got a camera on it. If you steal one ball off that tree, we're coming to your house. (laughs) But I walk up and down these hallways, and you know, they've been doing all this decorating, and I'm like, well, that chair's in the wrong place. That chair goes down there. Oh, wait, wait, they move. This morning, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, it's pouring down rain. Hey, Miss Christine, we need to make sure those rain bags are out because it's raining. I have signs that are all around this facility that says, if you prayed to receive Jesus Christ today, scan this and send it. Basically, it's you saying, hey, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I want to talk to somebody about this. I want to make sure they're out. Somebody keeps moving them. I don't know. I think it's Craig. Craig, you keep moving my stuff. I love, I love walking in and smelling the coffee as it's brewing. I love, I know some of you are sitting there and you're like, I parked way out today. I had to park in bad parking. First of all, most of our parking's bad parking. And we don't have, we might have half the people here today that normally show up on a Sunday. So first of all, can you just, I don't, you shouldn't thank God for that, but my goodness, I mean, you know. I park all the way out there underneath that oak tree. I like to. You know why? I like the walk. I say this. If you show up when I do it at 7 a.m., there's all kinds of parking available. I love the walk. I love kicking the gravel. I love coming in. I love being in this place. I'm not one of those guys that's going to hide or hang out in the green room while you guys are out here singing and I'm going to come in this room. Why? Because I love the worship. I love the singing. I do it, I do it more than you do. I do it twice, Patrick, and I do it twice every single Sunday. And there are times I'll even say, I know I've heard the song twice, but let's sing it again. If you ever watch me and they'll look at me, if I can get the guitar guys to look at me and they see me do this, here's what I mean, keep going. 
I want to sing it. So I'm just saying, guys, there's nothing, there is nothing that is fleshly that draws me to this place. It's not like, what can I get out of this? How can I, how can I uh, you know, be exalted in this place? But there's something, the day that I got saved, there's something that says, you know what? I just like being here. You know what? I just enjoy walking the halls with these people. The day I got saved, it's just like, you know what? It's like this is the place where I can identify with others. It's a spiritual discipline. If you look in your life and you say, you know what, I'm perfectly fine without going to church, then you've got to question whether you've truly known the Lord. But then there's a fourth discipline. I'm going to share my faith with others. I'm going to share my faith with the lost. How terrible would it be for me to have the greatest, greatest, uh, um, the greatest help to the history of mankind, and yet I keep it to myself. I don't want to talk about Jesus. You've heard folks, and I've heard folks say this. Well, you know, my faith is a personal thing. Are you kidding me? It is personal that is so overflowing, I couldn't contain it inside if I wanted to. It flows out of my mouth. Why? Because it's what's down in the well. Y'all awful quiet that first service. They were amening me and they were clapping. <laughs> Keep on preacher. And I'm like, no, no, that second service, they're chomping at the bit. They're ready to get in here. They're going to be so excited today. They'll preach me to death. I lied. I got to send out an email to all the first service folks. I was wrong. Y'all are much more exciting than they are. Four spiritual disciplines. I'm just saying, Jesus is saying this. Sincere disciples continue to grow spiritually. That's the truth. But then he gives us the truth on sin. And here's that. Sin will bind and blind you. Look at verse 34. Jesus said in verse 34, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Now, the word commit here, it's not speaking of, you know, you uh, occasionally or an isolated sin that you commit once or twice. The, the, the verb tense here, it actually reads this way. Everyone who continues to commit sin is a slave of sin. The Jewish leaders, they were boasting. The mafia were boasting. They said, we're, we're children of Abraham. We've never been slaves. And how many of you like me, you read that and you just kind of laughed out loud and you're like, are you kidding me? You don't even know your history. You were slaves to the Egyptians and then you were slaves to the Assyrians and then you were slaves to the Babylonians. And the very moment that they made this statement, they found themselves living under Roman rule. All they've ever known is Slavery. They were blind, and they were in bondage to sin. But that's what sin does, isn't it? Sin binds you, and it blinds you. Now, if you or you know someone who has ever struggled with addiction, you can understand. It's like a person who's hooked on cigarettes, and you're like, you know what? You really should stop smoking cigarettes. You ought to give those cigarettes off. You need to quit. And they say, I can quit any time I want to. I've already quit 100 times. They're bound and they're blind, right? It may also be a physical addiction, as we mentioned, like drugs, alcohol, or pornography. Did you know pornography is an addiction? Do you know pornography perverts your mind? Do you know pornography will affect every relationship in your life because it, it devalues the human gift of life? I would argue this, that someone addicted to pornography today, that that is the strongest addiction out there because so much of the world doesn't think there's anything wrong with it. And it used to be, you'd have to get in a car and you'd have to drive down to some seedy gas station and walk up to the counter and ask someone from behind the counter to buy a magazine. And now all you have to do is pull out that phone. And the devil's using it to poison you. And just as we would treat someone that is a drug addict or an alcoholic, friend, understand, treat that pornography the very same way. Don't sit there and say, I can handle it and deal with it by myself. If you could, you would. Let me encourage you. You reach out. 
Reach out to me, reach out to our staff. We got some ways to help you with that. I didn't mean to jump off on that, but I just recently saw some statistics of the number of individuals that are addicted to pornography. It used to be that I would talk about young men that are addicted to pornography, but now it's young men, it's young women, it's older men, it's older women, it's children, and the devil is using it to bind and blind. But there's also the bondage to sins of disposition. You may be someone that's in bondage to a negative critical spirit. You may be someone who is in bondage to worry and anxiety. I mean, one of the greatest or one of the saddest stories that we see in the Bible when it comes to being bind or being binded or bound and blind to your sin is Samson. You remember Samson? They say Samson was a he man with a she problem. You're like, Samson, I remember that guy. He had, he had long hair, and he got strength in his hair being long. No, that, the hair represented that, but his strength wasn't in his hair. God gave him strength through the Holy Spirit. And so we see in Samson's life this, this downward spiral away from God. And then all of a sudden, Samson got his hair chopped off, as, as I heard one old country preacher preach in the devil's barbershop. The Bible says he woke up to fight the Philistines. You can go over to Judges 16. You can read about it. Judges 16, 20. It says that Samson did not even realize that his strength had left him. He didn't even realize the Lord had left him. He was blind to the fact that his sin has sapped his source of strength. And then what happened? The Philistines literally, physically blinded him. They bound him. They put this great warrior now at work as a slave. Can I ask you, can you identify with Samson? Have you found that sin has sapped you of your spiritual strength? I heard Dr. Adrian Rogers say this one time. Sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go. It'll keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And it'll cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. So Jesus is talking the truth. The truth about discipleship, he's saying, hey, not everybody who says that they are with me are with me. We'll really find out. We'll see if they continue to follow me, and we're going to see they're not going to continue to follow him, some of them. So he says, no, 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 a real disciple, a genuine, sincere disciple, they're going to grow spiritually in their life. The proof is in the pudding, right? And then he says, let's talk about the truth of sin. Man, sin, it's going to bind you and it's going to blind you. And sin wants to rob you and sin wants to destroy you. But then here's what I always love about Jesus. He's going to end it on a high note. He's going to talk about freedom. See, here's the truth about freedom. The Son, Jesus, will forgive and free you. You may find yourself in one of those first two categories. He says, that's okay, that's all right. You can come to me as you are because if you could remedy the problem you had, you would have already done that. But instead, come to me, I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you, I'll set you free. We just sang about it. Look at what he says there in verse 36. He says in verse 36, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I think of the song Amazing Grace. I've always liked that song. Amazing Grace. I can remember the little country church I grew up on and uh, the lady that played the piano. I don't know. Maybe she didn't know notes. I think she may have used shape notes or something, but every song sounded like she was in a, uh, or what I've been told, a, uh, um, a honky-tonk sounds like. Gling, 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 every song. And I'm like, can we do Amazing Grace? Because at least she could play Amazing Grace and it sounded well. And how can you mess up Amazing Grace? And I thought that's the greatest song. It can never, ever be helped. There's no way you can improve on Amazing Grace. And then several years ago, a guy by the name of Chris Tomlin came along and he wrote a bridge to Amazing Grace. We sing it here. Matter of fact, we're going to sing it at the end of the service today. I can't even sing the song without singing it this way. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God and Savior have ransomed me. 
And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. I started way too high. I knew when I got to that one point, oh, you shouldn't have started that high. That was going to be hard. And there's always some of you that are so sweet. Pastor, I love to hear you sing. I wish you'd sing more. And then there are those of you that I normally consider to be good friends that are like, do you have to sing? You shouldn't really sing, man. That's not really that, that good. You know, we, we, we say America is the land of the free, but let's just be honest. It's not free. It cost. We know that the freedom that we experience as a country, we enjoy as a country, it has cost people their lives. There are many of you in this room that know people that have laid down their lives so that we might have the freedom in our country today. We'll stop and think when it comes to spiritual freedom. It is also true. Spiritual freedom is not going to cost you a thing, but it is not free because it costs Jesus laying down his life to forgive us and to do what? To set us free. I want you to listen to how the Bible identifies Jesus. This is in Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, the last book of the Bible. Listen to what it says. It says, to him, that being Jesus, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So here's what that means. That because Jesus Christ paid the price, then you and I, no longer have to worry about the fear of judgment, the fear of shame, right? The fear of guilt. We can now have freedom from judgment and shame and guilt because of Jesus. But if you're, gonna, if you're going to have freedom in Christ, you've got to understand what freedom really is. Freedom is not you doing anything that you want to do. Freedom is being the person that God has created you to be. I'll explain it this way. Have you ever heard somebody say this? You know what? I can do anything that I want to do because it's a free country. And that's true. But usually when they make a statement like that, chances are they're doing something that is going to put them in the bondage of sin. Real freedom is understanding who God created you to be. That your identity should not be shaped by what you do or what you don't do. Your identity should not be shaped by what others think about you or what others even say about you. Your identity should be found in who you are in Jesus Christ. Give him praise this morning. And Revelation 1, 6 says that God has put all Christians all believers in a kingdom, and he calls us what? Priest. Priest. Now, that's interesting. You don't usually think of yourself as being a priest. It's a doctrine called the priesthood of the believer. I've had folks say, well, you'll never read in the Bible those words, priesthood of the believer. <laughs> you'll never read in the Bible Sunday school or life groups, but they're a pretty good thing. Priest to the believer, the doctrine is found all throughout the Word of God. Let me explain it this way. In the Old Testament, there was an office, there was a position, and the priests were at the temple, but you never, never ever read about priests being a special class of Christians in the New Testament. Here's what happened. The pagan religion of Rome, that was in place when Constantine legalized Christianity. And they had this elaborate system of priests. There are folks that say, oh, Constantine, he Christianized paganism. No, he didn't. He paganized Christianity. And to this day, you are aware that some expressions of Christianity have a special status in them for those who are called priests. But the truth is, according to God's word, if you've been redeemed, you know Jesus is your Lord, right? Your faith and trust are in him. Then you are a part of God's kingdom as a priest. As a priest. Now, there are two jobs that we see in the Old Testament that the priest did. And that's what all of us should be doing. First of all, a priest talked to others on behalf of God. 
Hey, here's the truth of God's word. Hey, here's what God says. Here's what God's will is according to his word. It means that they went around and they said, here's what God's word says. That you and I, if we're saved, right, we're redeemed, we're set free, that that is a job description that belongs to us as priest. Again, it doesn't mean that we walk around looking for opportunities to take our 50-pound Bible and hit people over the head and say, you moron, look at how stupid you are. Here's what the Word of God says. We don't take, God help us, that we stop taking enjoyment in the fact that people fall. Who in this room wants someone taking great delight in our failure? But instead, man, my heart's broken. Because I may not have failed in the same flavor or the same way that you did, but I'm a failure too. But Jesus Christ has set me free from that failure. Can I share with you what God's word has to say? So one of the jobs of the priest was to tell others what God says, and the other job of the priest was to speak to God on behalf of others. It's called intercessory prayer. Does intercessory prayer make a difference? Is there power in intercessory prayer? Intercessory prayer, going to God on behalf of other people. Oh God, please save them. Oh God, please change them. Oh God, please work a miracle in their life. Unfortunately, for most of us, what happens is, and what dictates most of our prayer time is, it's all about us. Hey God, make me comfortable. Hey God, do this for me. But instead, as priests, those that are in Christ, I'm interceding on behalf of others. Is there power in intercessory prayer? Are you kidding me? If it weren't for intercessory prayer, I wouldn't be before you today. If it wasn't for intercessory prayer, I wouldn't have a song to sing. If it weren't for intercessory prayer, I would not be saved. As is some of you. Oh, but man, I had people who loved me and loved the Lord. And they cried out to God on my behalf. They interceded for me before I even knew I needed to be interceded for. Oh, God, save him. Oh, God, make yourself known to him. Oh, God, call him. Oh, God, use him. And there's power in intercessory prayer. Here's what I mean. It's not that you sit there and say, oh, if we only had someone that could go to God the Father. No, understand that because of the high priest being Jesus, a high priest being your Lord, right? Being the one that has shed his blood for your sin and your faith is in him. He now decrees to you based upon this passage, you are a priest as well. Go to the Father. Intercede for others. Share the word. Oh, this is better preaching than you're acting like today. (laughs) But I can promise you this. When you share God's truth, get ready because it will set you free or it will make you mad. I can remember one of the first times that I ever shared a particular biblical truth and it made somebody mad. I was fresh out of college. I was preaching at a church in northeast Arkansas, and uh, there was still a lot of racism there at the time. And I'd found out that during the height of the civil rights movement, this church, this would have been back in the 60s, so this would have been 30 years before, but this church actually voted as a church and said that if, uh, if a black man or woman tried to come in that church, they were going to station people at the doors and keep them from coming in. And i got to be honest, even though it was 30 years before, once I heard that, it lit me up. And... Uh, I wasn't as tactful back then as I am now. (laughs) Yeah, 25-year-old Stephen, you wouldn't want to hang around him. And so I stood up one Sunday and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going, to, I'm going to address this issue. And I preached from 1 John 4 where it says, if a man loves God and he doesn't love his brother, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. And I said that God is no respecter of persons. Again, probably a lot more zeal than knowledge. But I said it bluntly. 
If you say that you love God and you don't love a brother or sister because their skin is black, brown, yellow, or purple, you're a liar and you've never been born again. You need to repent and you need to get saved. They did not respond that way. Not a single amen. Silence. Just dead silence. After the service, there was a deacon that came to me. He was so mad. His whole head was red, and he was so mad, he was literally shaking. Little old bitty short guy, had a short tie and a long stomach. (laughs) And I'll never forget what he said. He said, son, I don't care what you say. But I'll never love, and he used a terribly offensive word. And I said, well, what about what the Bible says? And here's what he said. I don't care what the Bible says. And that was his problem. And that's the problem in our culture today. I don't care what the Bible has to say. That there are multitudes of people that are out there and that's the same attitude. I don't care what the Bible has to say. I don't care what truth is. No, this is truth for me. I've already decided this is my truth. And so we live in this culture where we've lost the idea of what is wrong and what is right. And in a culture where we have all these absolute truths that are being disregarded and rejected, what are we supposed to do as a church? Speak the truth. Don't miss this. And speak the truth in love. That if we don't say good is good and evil is evil, who is going to say that? But we need both truth and love. Truth without love is harsh brutality, and love without truth is empty sentimentalism. I close with this. 247 years ago, I did a lot of reading this week. 247 years ago, our founding fathers revealed that they believed in absolute truth. They are the ones who wrote this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created, are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Thomas Jefferson is the one that composed that sentence. Later on, he said that self-evident truth. Here's what he said. It means these are universal truths that need no proof. They are unquestionable, he said. They are without debate. The absolute truth of human equality was a radical statement. And they got it from the Bible. The Bible says this, that God is no respecter of persons. Our founders in this country, contrary to what you will hear, they actually had the view that morality was based on the truths laid out in the Bible. And then later on, 234 years ago, President George Washington was giving his very first inaugural address and his first official act as president was to give a prayer to the God who rules over the universe that he would bless the liberties and the people of the United States. And then after he spoke for about 10 minutes, he concluded his speech with a stern warning. Again, it's like he was looking into a lens seeing today. It's become a prophecy that I I believe we've seen fulfilled in the last 50 years. Here's what he said. He said, the favorable smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. Jesus said it that way. Or he said it this way. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So let's talk about what truth. What truth is he, is he speaking into your life today? There are some of you here today, and you've put your trust and your faith for an eternal home in being a member of the church, or you were baptized, or you've done deeds that we would say are religious actions, but the reality is you've never, ever relinquished control of your life to Jesus, and there's no proof in your life of spiritual growth or spiritual maturity and the things that we mentioned, those four essential doctrines of walking in the way of Christ, they're absent in your life. 
What is the truth for you today? Turn to Jesus. Right now, this moment, right where you sit. Don't even wait till we sing. Right where you sit, right now, call out to him, Jesus, save me. Jesus, come into my life. I surrender to you. I'm letting go of me. I surrender to you. My faith and trust are in you. Save me from my sin. Friend, I'm telling you, if that's the very evidence of your heart, he'll do just that. Turn to Jesus. That's the truth. The truth is, there's only one way to heaven, and it's through a living, risen Savior, Jesus Christ. But here's the second truth. We've already, we've already identified the fact that it's the Sunday after uh, Thanksgiving. You could have not been here. Nobody would have thought anything about it. They thought you were at Grandma's house, pouring down rain outside, bitterly freezing cold. <laughs> but you're here. So I can almost make the assumption that everybody in this room is a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I won't make that, but if there was ever a Sunday, maybe. What is the truth for you? How will they hear unless someone goes? How will they know they need to be saved unless someone shares? How will they be set free unless you use your voice to say, can I tell you of the one who freed me? Well, pastor, if I intercede on behalf of people to get saved, does that mean that they're going to get saved? I just say this, it ain't going to hurt. Chances are, it's going to make things a little bit better. I don't understand it. I don't get it because I believe in the sovereign God. But God has chosen the work through the prayers of his people. We see that scattered throughout Scripture. But I will make this statement, brother or sister in Christ. Shouldn't it at least give them an advantage that they live across the street from you? Shouldn't it ought to get them at least a little bit closer that they work with you? Students, that they go to school with you? Shouldn't that at least make a difference? Well, if we're taking seriously our role of being priest, I'd say so. And so during this time when we sing this great old song, maybe today you need to come and intercede on behalf of others. Lord, save them and use me to do it. There'll be pastors down front. If you're ready to give your life to Jesus, you need a prayer to talk about anything. How can I be a part of this church? You can come. You've prayed that prayer. You gave your life to Christ. You're unashamed. Come. Or if you just want to come, get by yourself in this altar and pray. Come. Oh, God, may you speak. May we listen. And now as we exalt you, King Jesus, in this song of praise... We thank you that, yes, you've told us the truth about what discipleship is. And, yes, you've told us that sin binds and blinds. But, yes, praise you, Jesus. You've told us that you forgive and you set free. Oh, Lord, set free today. Set free. For it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the 
hour I first be Come on, sing it out. My chains are gone. I've been saved. Mercy. 